Hello, and welcome back to Brian's Hobby Hammering Out. In this second episode, we're going to have a quick look at my airbrush setup in more detail. So, for the basis of my airbrush setup over here, I'm not so worried about the clean and dirty water. They're there largely for brush painting. The wet palette isn't used. What's used predominantly is the spray booth. Cheap airbrush. This is unbranded. Has a good sized reservoir. The type of airbrush is gravity fed. You've got a dual action trigger pull. So pushing down lets air through. Pulling back is how you release your paint. The further back you pull, the more paint comes out. There is some control on both my airbrushes from a little adjuster at the rear that will control how far the trigger can come. If you're looking for an airbrush, you want the gravity fed dual action for miniature painting. It's the best variety. Otherwise, and the most important thing when you're first starting is the compressor. A cheap 25 pound airbrush is fine. I still use this airbrush for most of my heavy duty work. It does my priming and it does my varnishing. The paints that I'm tending not to thin down. My then very expensive airbrush is used for detail work. This one has a 0.3 needle, this one has a 0.2 needle in it. The needle size to some degree controls how fine the paint comes out. The compressor, that is the important part. You want something that's quiet, so 40 to 50 decibels. Usually I think this one's about 47. That way you're not being deafened when it's running. You want some kind of cylinder so it will store some air up prior to working. You need a pressure gauge and you need some way to control the pressure so that you can make sure the air is coming out at the pressure that you want it. Um, still wasn't ridiculously cheap. I think the compressor with the airbrush came out about £85 from Amazon. You want a rapid turnover time and I will show when I'm painting my cleaning process in more detail. But that's why you want a water bottle with the nozzle. I have two places that those paints can get emptied into. So if it's not going through the brush, it can be tipped out into this container. If it's coming through the brush, cleaning out the inside, it goes into this little airbrush cleaner which stops the liquid spraying everywhere and keeps the particles under control. A reasonable face mask is important. Airbrushing puts out lots of really small particles of paint so you don't want to be breathing those in so I would strongly recommend. It doesn't need to be quite as heavy duty as industrial as this. Most Covid masks will do it. Um, maybe it's a use when we don't need to use them outside anymore. This is just personal preference so that I don't get paint all over my hand. Though when I'm painting with a brush, I tend to paint the back of my hand. So horses for courses, really. Then when I'm painting, I'm painting into the booth. So that's the dedicated setup. I have airbrush based primers because I do all of my priming with an airbrush. That way I don't have to go outside in the cold, I'm not weather dependent, and it's far quicker and more accurate, and more environmentally friendly than using a rattle can. Same with my varnishes. I have three airbrush based varnishes. I have matte, satin, and gloss. 
and we'll look at varnishes in more detail when I look at paints in more detail. Needle juice, when you clean your airbrush, you need to put a light layer of oil over the ne needle and you might have some other parts that you want to keep oiled. So this is basically my airbrush oil. Airbrush cleaner does what it says on the tin. I tend to run water through first and then when I'm cleaning the airbrush at the end of the day, I will put a final dose of airbrush cleaner through just to make sure everything's cleaned out. Or if I'm breaking everything down to do a full clean, again, I'll use airbrush cleaner. Airbrush thinner, again, it thins the paint. This doesn't have to just be used in airbrushes. It can be used for conventional brush painting. I quite often use that. I will use water far less for thinning. I'll also use glazed medium, but that doesn't get used in my airbrush. Airbrush flow improver enables me to, well, ease the flow, but it gets used again in conventional paints because it means that your paint is more likely to flow into the crevices and cracks and crannies of your miniature, which if you're creating a wash where you're trying to create shadows is a useful effect to have. As I mentioned in the other video, I have in this case, it's unbranded so it's magic dough, but Silly Putty works really well when you're trying to create masks for airbrushing and what you're doing is you're masking off areas so that when you spray one area you don't get any paint over your other paint. Cling film does the same thing, it's good for larger areas, um, areas that are less fiddly to get to where you're not worried about the cling film breaking. I have spare needles. Needles are almost a consumable part in an airbrush. They're what controls to some degree how widely your paint spreads, therefore how much control you have over it. So you'll want a bigger needle for something doing a wider area, a thinner need needle for detail. In my expensive brush, I only ever have a thin needle. These came free with my airbrush. I'm not a big fan on them. I'll use a Q-tip for cleaning it. Unless I've got a really bad clog, I'm not going to want to use those. They might scratch the inside of my airbrush. Some people recommend them, some people don't. Q-tips are here for cleaning around the inside of the airbrush. These paints aren't airbrush specific. You can buy ones that are designed for airbrush. A lot of the time you may still want to thin them down a bit if you're using them for glazes, if you're trying to do close up detail work, um, but you'd be able to use them raw for base coats. Um, I know Vallejo, who do most of the paints that I'm currently using, produce a range and airbrush is another reason for having dropper bottles. It makes it far easier to control putting your paint into the reservoir of your airbrush. So if we look at the anatomy of the airbrush, reservoir holds your paint. I've got a quick release, though they don't always come with one, um, clip for my hose from my compressor, trigger, dual action, down for air, back to release your paint, nozzle at the front, which if I undo the nozzle cover, you can see the needle behind, and as I pull it back, the needle retreats, the further back the needle goes, the more paint comes out. The thinner the needle, 
close the paint is when it comes out of your nozzle. Then in the back, you've got this screw mechanism which controls how far back your needle can go. So that can be used to prevent that coming too far back. There's a similar mechanism on the Infinity. The Infinity CR Plus, which is my expensive one, I did a reasonable amount of research and it's the one a lot of people recommended, but do your own research, find what's right for you. I found what's right for me, but that might be different to other people. If I then unscrew the retainer, I can remove my needle for cleaning. Um, if your airbrush will let you, I would recommend always taking it forward. This one won't, so it has to come out the back and go back in. You can remove the needle holder. I'll go through that when I do a separate video on cleaning and breaking down an airbrush. Um, but you just want to make sure that's all the way in and slide that back on. Then get that back on square. There's a little loop that that needs to slide into the back. There we go. So they're not complicated, they're not hard to break down, and they are very useful tools. I've been painting for longer than I'm going to admit to. Um, I've only just started airbrushing. I've resisted for years and I regret it. I've been airbrushing for about three months now. Um, and they make such a difference with so many different things you can do. I'll go through those in more detail in later videos. This one's just really looking at the setup so that if you want to try airbrushing, you know what's there. They're worth it just for varnishing because when you varnish from a rattle can, it can go wrong and that can ruin the miniature you painted. They're useful for priming, especially Zenithal priming, and for doing your base coat colors. They'll do so much more than that, but even for just those basic skills, it's worthwhile. And we'll look at those skills in various videos as I go along. My plan for videos when I start painting, and there is another video coming on my paints first, is to each miniature that I do, we will go through the whole process. So some of them will have airbrushing, some of them won't. Um, they'll all have brushwork of some kind and it will be all of the painting I do for that miniature till I complete it. Um, some of them will be sped up but I intend to show the entire process. I don't intend to edit and chop and change. So there'll be lots of mistakes, lots of me messing up but hopefully some really valuable bits. Um, some of it may be fairly boring but that I will enable you to fast forward through. That's the advantage of YouTube. So I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope like me you're looking forward to some of the future videos. Um, if you did like it please kick like, click subscribe and the little bell icon to notify you if you want to watch more. Um, come and look for the other videos we're going to be doing. There's going to be over the shoulder gaming which is me putting a run, running commentary over my wife's playing of single player board games and putting some extra story to it. Um, they may be the death of me. Or there's going to be some bits on computer games, um, whether they're fantasy games or space flight sims. I'm going to certainly be looking at Elite Dangerous Odyssey when it fully releases. Um, so various bits and pieces, might be some more bits on storytelling, there might be other bits on basic board games. Um, come and join the fun and hopefully we'll see you either on Discord or Facebook via the links in the YouTube video. Bye.